fondest memory of a distant childhood in a distant Korea was when she used to visit her grandmother's house. There, dropped like a patch of vibrant green and molded concrete, was the madang, the courtyard within a traditional Korean home, an outdoor living room, if you will. It was there where Grace Kim first played make-believe, creating a space where real life and the abstract first met. For Dr. Grace Kim, professor and writer of theology and the Korean-American experience, the Madang is a sacred place for guests to openly share their experiences and work, a place where real life and ideas are up for discussion. This podcast welcomes guests to speak openly on modern issues in religion and culture. The Madang is open. I invite you to come in, converse, and stay for a while. Welcome to Madang. I'm so happy that you can join us today. We have a very special guest, uh, Dr. McGill de la Torre, who is a professor of social ethics and Latinx studies at Eilif School of Theology. He is the author of 36 books. And by the end of this year, 2021, he will have 41. I can't imagine 41, but anyway, we'll get into that too. Uh, he's a filmmaker, an ordained uh, Baptist minister, an activist, a speaker. He does everything. I'm so glad that he's on today. So welcome, Dr. De La Torre. Welcome to our podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I am so excited to have you. I just, to, before we get into the book, I wanted to ask you, because I ask you this every time I meet you, but I, so I'll ask you today, how in the world do you write 41 books? <laughs> I, just don't, I can't imagine. So how do you do it, Miguel? Tell us. Quite frankly, um, I just write every morning um, for about five or six hours. Um, you do? And then that's it. But the thing yeah. is, it's one thing to write, but you have to have an idea to write. So I sit around sometimes with a blank, you know, blank brain. <laughs> I can't even think. <laughs> like you write four or five hours every day? Pretty much, yes. Oh my gosh. But then, you know, growing up, uh -huh. my first job was mopping floors um, as a janitor. So uh -huh. I'd rather, I rather uh, write for four or five hours than mop <laughs> floors for four or five hours. So uh, I, I don't really see it as, as a chore. I see it as, as really fun work. Oh, it, but you're amazing because I can sit for four or five hours and then after about 40 seconds, I'm like looking at what the latest stars are doing. <laughs> what the ladies movie stars are doing <laughs> so i am just amazed that i know you and i'm just so excited that you write and produce such important works and the book that we want to discuss today is your latest book uh decolonizing christianity do you have a do you have the book right next to you if you can hold it up so people can see I the do. Next cover yeah. yeah so it's called decolonizing christianity uh becoming badass believers Oops, and it keeps I, us appearing. <laughs> I know with that background, but thank you for holding that up. Um, and it follows your previous book called Bur Burying White Privilege. So I wanted to ask you how you began writing this particular book, Decolonizing Christianity. Well, the first book that I wrote um, about three or four years ago mm -hmm. uh, was called, um, as you said, Burying White Privilege. Um, um, and, and, and in that book, uh, Bearing White Privilege, Resurrecting a Badass Christianity. I forgot the subtitle there. Yeah. And, and, and in that book, basically, I was responding to really the Trump election. And, and, and what does it mean when the vast majority of, of, of white Christians, especially evangelicals, mm -hmm. supported a man who has said the most racist things not only against African Americans, but definitely Latinx and as well as Asian Americans. Yes. Um, so, how do white people vote, white Christians vote for this individual? And that got me thinking about the kind of faith and the kind of uh, Christianity they must have. Mm -hmm. And I remember James Cone, who said that uh, white theology is satanic, uh, basically saying that any theology that ignores Jim Crow or ignores slavery cannot be of God. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So I just expanded that and said, today, any Christianity that ignores children on our borders being put in cages or ignores that black lives do not matter in this country cannot be of God. So, so I, that's the book I wrote. Yeah, and actually, I should... before you get into, mm -hmm. before you say more, I must say it's a very good book, uh, Burying White Privilege. And I used a lot of it for my upcoming book, Invisible. It was such a um, informative book. So people who have not read your previous book, they should go and read that first before they read this one. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. No, so, so, so the book was very popular. It, uh -huh. it, 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 it very did popular. very well. Yeah. It did very well. Um, and then, of course, critiques start coming in. And one of the major critiques that I received was um, De La Torre does a great job in explaining what's wrong, but he fails to give us any solutions. I'm so and surprised with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that led me to this book, okay. where I pretty much begin by saying, um, do you ask the abused spouse to provide the solution for their abuse? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're, you're really asking the wrong person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and besides, the answer to, to, the, to the solution is quite simple. Um, stop killing us. I mean, yeah. stop abusing us. Mm -hmm. Stop oppressing us. Um, so, so the book really did a bit of a shift. It tried to answer that concern, but more importantly, I really did not write it to a white audience. I wrote it to other communities of color. Um, it's a conversation among ourselves. You about see, I agree with everything in the book, except for that, because I think it's <laughs> white people need to read this book. I think everyone needs to read the book. So I agree with every little point that you made in the book. <laughs> Except for that one. But anyway, go ahead. You can say that because yeah. you, it, was, it was your book. But I have to disagree <laughs> with you there. <laughs> no, then that's fine. And, but, but you see, I'm not saying white people should not read it. Mm -hmm. it what I am saying is, yeah. yeah, they're not the subject of the book. Mm -hmm. And if they do read it, they have the privilege of listening into a conversation mm -hmm. that you and I would have when there's no white people around. Yeah. I mean, this, this is... And <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, go ahead. No, no. So, 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 so it, basically, they, you know, it, they, they get to he, listen over our shoulder and uh -huh. eavesdrop as we are talking about um, the, 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 the struggles that we are having with white Christianity. Yeah. Um, and I must say, because that's the framework of how you're thinking, so they're kind of eavesdropping us. You did like. Your words, <laughs> I just some of them I can't repeat on this podcast. <laughs> but you didn't mince any words. I was like, wow, he's just you're like just going and going and going and going. And I was like, wow, you're like because this was published by Erdman's, right? Yes. Erdman's, yeah. And I published by embracing the other with Erdman's, and I'm thinking, I can't believe they allowed you to write those words. <laughs> and listeners, if you want to know what these words are, you have to go into the book to read it because uh, <laughs> some kids read. I mean, kids listen to this podcast too. When I put it up on YouTube, it's for kids too. So I can't repeat some of the words, but I'm like, wow, Miguel, this is incredible, <laughs> incredible literature that you have. But, but, I, but you know. But, but what's interesting is uh -huh. the, first of all, the vulgarity that I use is usually in Spanish. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Not in English. Well, there's some, there is some English in there. Oh, there is some. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, what, but what truly is vulgar, uh -huh. it's not the words that I'm using. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's what we are experiencing as people of color. Uh -huh. That's what's vulgar. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes the best word to describe the vulgarity of the lies we are forced to live mm -hmm. are, four, are four letters long. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> and I must say, you are so brave. Like, I feel like the, you were just unleashed in this book and you just, like, I don't have that kind of courage. So I'm like reading, I'm like so thankful that you had the courage to do <laughs> this and use those words when you needed to say it because what you just said is so correct. You know, what the situation is so vulgar. It's not, you know, so many times people blame us or people of color, but we're actually not the problem. 
Yeah. They are the problem. But so I think you just did it so nicely and you just did not hold back. I have read most of your works and I, I was quite entertained reading some of the words that you use. <laughs> so please, listeners, if you haven't read uh, Dr. De La Torre's book, please order it as you're listening to this <laughs> podcast. So I must ask you the question because you begin with whiteness. So tell us, tell us listeners, what you mean by white? Yeah, and that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm talking about white, mm -hmm. I am not talking about skin pigmentation. Yeah. And that's very important to realize. I am talk I'm using the word white to describe a white religion mm -hmm. that, uh, that, 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 that is complicit with oppression. I'm talking about whiteness as a world view of conquest. Mm -hmm. um, I am not speaking about skin pigmentation. So there are brown people and there are black people and there are yellow people and there are red people who are also white mm -hmm. because they have, their minds are so colonized that they have embraced a white worldview and see themselves through the eyes of whiteness. Mm -hmm. Hence the title of the book, Decolonizing Christianity. It really is an attempt of myself decolonizing my own mind of this white Eurocentric Christianity and in the process be in conversation with other people of color to do the same. Yeah and uh, you know it's one thing for you to write it it's another thing to actually do it because our minds have been colonized our beliefs have been colonized so it's really difficult to decolonize stuff that have been with us for most of our life. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you are addressing this and I'm hoping that readers will be able to do it as you say it. There was one sentence that really stuck out and you wrote, white Christianity is now and has historically been an apologist for white nationalism. Can you expand on that? Because it is so true, like it just stuck out at me. So can you just expand on that for our listeners? When I say white Christianity, Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. White Christianity is an ideology, a philosophy that exists for the sole and only purpose of justifying white supremacy. So that it becomes the spiritual foundation and the spiritual undergirding um, that provides moral authority to be oppressive. So that's why I, I, I said the sentence the way I, I, I wrote it. Yeah, so that, but that is what runs this country, America, isn't it? And it falsely preaches this kind of whiteness as the gospel. And so how do we stop this from continuing? Because it is just so embedded in our culture. It's embedded in our language. Uh, you know, scripture talks about false prophets all the time. So yeah. how, how do we stop this, this white well, Christianity? Because when I think about Christianity, so I grew up very conservative, Miguel, and you probably did too. So there's the unpacking of that. But I was taught, that God was white, a white male. We don't have to go into the maleness today. That We can save that for another time because that's a whole <laughs> new topic. But then also that Jesus was white mm -hmm. and white was good. So how do we unpack this? Because I think many of our listeners, many people who read your book will struggle with this for a while. And I know white people are going to read it, but even as people of color, we have bought into this. So how, like, teach us, Miguel. Well, when you say we, uh -huh. let, let's make sure we understand who the we is. If you're saying we people of color, then I would argue, as I do in the book, that we must reject the white Jesus, uh, the white theology, the right hermeneutics, the right liturgy, um, everything about Christianity that's white and Eurocentric must be rejected for our own salvation. So that is 2,000 years worth of stuff. So you want to reject it all. Absolutely. Be and, and, and in that rejection, uh -huh. we construct it based on our own symbols. 
What does it mean for me to instead um, embrace Jesus? What does it mean for an African-American to embrace a black Jesus? What does an Asian Jesus look like? In other words, how do we use our own cultural symbols by which to read the biblical text? For those of us who are Christian, you know, it might also mean, um, like my friend Tink Tinker would say, a total rejection of Christianity because it is beyond salvation. And, and that's a shame, mm -hmm. but I have to respect that view also. Mm -hmm. Now, if you say the we meaning white people, what do white people must do? Um, they need to get saved. Um, and, and the only way they're going to get saved is the same way, rejecting the white Jesus and bowing their knees to a black Jesus, to a brown new Jesus, to a yellow Jesus, to a Jesus that is of a different color. That's the only way white people can ever get saved because as long as they're following this white Jesus, this white Jesus cannot and is unable to save them. Instead, this white Jesus, as James Cone would say, um, is satanic. You see that, I agree with you, but that is going to be so difficult because, okay, first of all, Jesus was never white, but they made him white mm -hmm. in their own image for 2,000 years. That's going to be so hard for the white people to of reject. It is. Yeah. But see, if we take the Bible seriously, uh -huh. um, Jesus, if you want to see Jesus, if yeah. you really want to see Jesus, Jesus is a black, lesbian, um, undocumented immigrant um, making the beds at a hotel with AIDS. That which is most despised by society, that what society hates the most yeah. is Jesus in the here and now in flesh. Jesus is not or does not look like the banker who charges you an extra quarter percent on your mortgage because you're not white, or the police officer that kneels on your neck because you're not white, or the border patrol officer who throws your children into a cage because they're not white. Jesus cannot look like or be uh, symbolized mm -hmm. by the color of our oppression. Yeah, thank you for reminding us because I think this is the whole cycle of oppression. We just keep buying into this whiteness and even when we look at movies or our, our culture, you know, always white is good and black is bad, evil. And you see this in Star Wars, you see in so many mm -hmm. things. So it's really hard for us to reject it. But thank you for reminding us today and through your book and many of your other books, you keep reminding us. So thank you for that. You also talk about nationalist Christianity. So I thought that was very interesting. You said it's a use of expression, religious freedom, which reinforces white, cisgender, male supremacy <laughs> within <laughs> social structures designed to normalize oppressive policies imposed upon queers and non-whites while legitimizing the supposed dangers they represent to white America. So can you just unpack, it, unpack that for us? Because that's a lot <laughs> for us to take. <laughs> that, 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 that is a bit uh, to take. So, mm -hmm. so let me put it this way. Yeah. We have to go to the police department to get a permit from the police department. Who, who's we? Pro the people we, of color? We, we, the people of color, must okay. go to the police mm -hmm. department to get a permit from the police department to protest the police department for police brutality. We have domesticated protests. We have created the space where we can rebel and, and protest, but nothing changes. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm, I think I'm trying to, to do in, the, in, in this book is to argue that we cannot follow the rules that have been created to keep us silent and invisible. Mm -hmm. We have to be like Jesus, who is a rule breaker, mm -hmm. who literally walks into a temple, mm -hmm. makes a whip, yeah. And, and chases out all the bankers. Uh -huh. I mean, this is the kind of Christianity that I, that I would argue is badass, as the book would say. <laughs> yeah, so that, that you use that image, and I think that's so important because white Christianity, we don't, they don't like to linger on that image. 
of Jesus mm-hmm. going into the temple and whipping and, and overturning the tables. You know, they keep emphasizing the other kind of empire building mm-hmm. and so forth. So thank you for reminding us. And I, I also liked um, the chapter where you brought in about Jesus's willingness to learn from the woman of color. And you didn't hold back with the language there either. So I think that is such a great kind of um, chapter that you deal with. So for our listeners, can you just expand on that and why you chose that story? I mean, I I find that particular story of of Jesus um, uh, telling the disciples not to go into any Samaritan town, just go to the lost house of the... Uh, of Israel, and then he goes into into Samaritan, and and this woman of color, this Samaritan woman, comes to him and says, "Heal my child." Uh-huh. Um, I, and and Jesus ignores her, and then she keeps begging, and then he goes, "It's not good for me to take the food of the children and give them to the dogs." Um, and, and of course, I use the the female dog. Uh, would they? Yeah, I know, which we won't repeat here because <laughs> we won't repeat here. <laughs> so that's why they have to go and read your book. Yeah. I think to get the full effect, right? Yeah, they, they need to read your book because they're not going to. But, 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 but that's a shocking thing for Jesus to yeah. call a woman. Yeah, you know, I when, when you think about it. So, so the but, but then the woman tells that even the dogs get the food that fall from the master's table. And Jesus at that point learns that his message is not just for the lost house of Israel. And we know this because after this chapter, he begins to tell the disciples to go to all nations and to all people and to tell everyone the good news. So it wasn't until he meets this woman of color, this woman that is despised by his people, that he learns what his mission is. And for your readers who, or, or your listeners who are thinking, well, wait a minute, Jesus can't learn. Jesus is all is God. How can he? No, see, Christ? that's why I love it because you flipped it around. Yeah. So continue. Yeah. I mean, did Jesus learn how to be potty trained? Did Jesus <laughs> learn how to walk? Did Jesus learn how to talk? Jesus had to learn how to be human. And part of that experience is learning the biases and the prejudice of his community. So Jesus had to learn not to be racist like the other. Now, now of course, when I use the word racism, that wouldn't exist during his time. I'm I'm obviously taking some literary license with the term, but the point is the biases and the prejudice that were inherent in his community, he had to learn not not to be that way either. So yes, Jesus learns Um, and that's exciting. Thank you for uh, sharing that. I think that's so interesting. And even as a feminist theologian, I recognize that there are so few stories of women. And this is one story that I don't think I've ever used in any of my writing. So I may have to quote you sometime for this one because I think you said it so in your face, I think, which is so necessary in today's time. Everything in the book is so in your face, but this particular story, I think it was so well done and you just did such a great job of how, uh, you know, Jesus learns and and just the language that you use with the woman and so forth. So thank you so much for that. Um, And then you continue on in the book, which, you know, you talk about uh, communities of color who have been castrated. So there's a lot of this language that you keep using threaded throughout the book. So, and then you say, uh, having castrated and lack of power, privilege and prof- uh, profit afforded by the phallic symbol. So, and you go on and on and on and on using this symbol. So just for our listeners, tell us why you use the symbol. Right. Um, I, and yeah, say it. It's a pow- yeah, no, it's a powerful symbol because yeah. we, we find in the book of Acts mm-hmm. in where basically in order to be a, um, you know, it, one of the first debates, one of the first arguments among the apostles were, must you, first, must you first become a Jew before you become a Christian? And it was, must you first be circumcised before you could become a Christian? And, and, and we know the debate went on. And at the end, they decided that, no, you don't have to be circumcised to, to become a Christian. 
And, and what, what I'm, I'm taking that image and saying, but yet that is what we're asking people of color to do, to circumcise their culture, to cut off a portion of their culture and become white before they could become a Christian. So when you went to, to theological school and I went to a theological school, we first had to learn um, Karl Barth and we had to learn Bultmann and we had to learn Buna and we had to learn all these good German names. And we had to become white thinkers before we could ever be a, um, a, 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 a Christian thinker. I mean, why didn't we have to look, read, uh, read the writings of Song or, write, or read the writings of Park or, uh, or, or, read, or read the writings of um, Isasi Diaz or, or Uso Gonzalez? I mean, these weren't required readings, but we had to read everything that was right. So we, in a way, we literally committed self-circumcision mm -hmm. so that we can then become Christian thinkers. And, oh. and I don't want to cut anything. Yeah, but Miguel, that was like, we studied about 20, 30 years ago. And I don't think much has changed, to be no, honest. No, it hasn't. Yeah. So it's not really talking in the past. Even today, no, the curriculum is so Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. And um, the only yeah. place where your books or my books are yeah. being read mm -hmm. are usually when they're taught by faculty of color. Yeah. Or, and then they're an elective course. So they're not even exactly. the course that you need to graduate from. So yeah, so it things haven't changed, even though so many scholars of color are here mm -hmm. and so many of us are writing and trying to decolonize Christianity and, and trying to shed light. And you are one of those big voices that are doing it, but still, we are still pushed in the margins. And some of us are not even taken seriously. And McGill, as a woman of color too, that's like, I've had students say, they've got nothing to learn from a woman. I'm like, okay, well, Jesus came from a woman. So deal with it. But you know, this is still going on today. So even though, um, you know, we have writers like you and so many other scholars of color, Black theologian, womanist theologian, Mirista, Asian American, um, Native American, we are still pushed and people are not reading it. Okay. So I think your imagery of the castration is so important. And I know, you know, missiology, when missionaries went out, you know, to different parts of the world, you know, I know Asia the best because I was born in Korea. They told us our beliefs were all evil. Mm -hmm. Everything, our, our um, ancestor worship was evil. Anything, any kind of um, cultural art in our homes were evil. I remember my mom came back. One time we had a, a summer vacation in Korea. She came back home and she threw every Korean like doll, painting, little figure. She threw everything away. She went crazy because missionaries and then Christians told her that that was all evil. They said it was all like the devil was all hidden in there. And she took it as the truth and she threw everything out to my horror because I loved it, but she threw everything out. So I, I love your imagery of the castration and your other languages <laughs> in there. So uh, thank you for reminding us. Um, you also in the book talk a lot about hatred and fear and loathing that's happening. So can you just share with us what you are referring to and what you want us to know about all this? One of the foundations of white Christianity is the fear of the other and, 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 and the hatred of the other. I mean, it's not just that they don't understand the other, they hate the other. And, and we don't have to go too far. I mean, just the horrors of what happened, you know, just a week ago yes. in, um, in Atlanta, that's, I mean, that's hatred, that's loathing, that's um, fear of, um, all wrapped up in a young white Christian who is doing this in the name of his white God and white Jesus. Yes. 
And it doesn't matter that the church has denounced him. The church is what created him. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and I'll be honest with you. I am tired. Um, I am sick that our people, and I say our people, because whether it be black people or, or, or yellow people or brown people or red people, we are being slaughtered, literally slaughtered on a daily basis. And white Christianity has nothing to say about it. Yeah. Nothing to say about it. Yeah, it is scary. Yeah. And, you know, March 16 murders of eight people and society and even that cop having such a hard time naming it for what it is. That yeah. is hate. I don't know. You learned that in elementary school. I don't know why people can't see it. And they're trying to figure out, oh, he had a bad day and oh, sex addiction. addiction hate is hate to me it is so obvious he witnesses have already said he went in there saying kill all asians that was his motivation it is hate and we have to stop this hate towards people of color and as you said people are dying people are being murdered you know um i had russell jung uh, previous before your podcast and he he started, he co-founded um, Stop AAPI Hate. And from last March till now, uh, a full year, uh, just the reported ones, 3,800 cases of hate, uh, either verbal or physical. And we know, Miguel, not everybody has the courage to report, especially Asian, mm -hmm. American, oh, yeah. Yeah, Asian American community where we live in the honor shame. So this is ongoing and, and we must know that it's not a recent thing. This hatred towards people of color with slavery, with taking, taking over Mexican land and the genocide and, and the indentured workers, it's just part of this white nationalism, this white Christianity that perpetuated it. So your book addresses it and it just addresses it so head on so i'm thankful for the language that you use and the imagery that you use and then you also you know address you know people who talk about oh i don't see color mm -hmm. how you know so many people in our pews keep saying that i don't see color so tell us what that means yeah well if people can't see color number one they should buy new glasses <laughs> because nothing personal, but I just noticed that you're an Asian person. I didn't know you were Asian before. I never seen color. I mean, that's so ridiculous. It's laughable. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 but, but, but somehow by saying, I don't see color, what they really are saying is you, 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 know, you are just like a white person. And I treat you just like a white person. I want people to see me and my culture and who I am. Um, but this color blindness is part of a, a, of a religious right, a conservative white ideology that somehow excuses me from my complicity with these racist structures that are designed to privilege me. So as long as I don't see color, mm -hmm. or as Trump would say, I don't have a racist bone in my body, then I'm okay. But, but I'll be very clear. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I'll, I'll leave race for a moment. Let, let's, let's talk about sex. I, I occupy a male body. Okay. I am a sexist. How can I not be a sexist? I grew up in a culture and a society that has taught me since I was a young boy how to be a sexist. And no matter how much I may march with women and wear those funny pink hats, um, at the end of the day, I'm going to be paid more than a woman will because the culture is sexist for me. Mm -hmm. Now, I could say I'm a recovering sexist. I'm doing my best not to be a sexist. It is a struggle because I could fall off the ragged and I do way too many times. But it is a way of trying to decolonize and undo the damage that was done to me in teaching me and forming me as a sexist. 
So I'm trying to recover. I'm trying not to fall into that trap. In the same way, every white person listening to us right now is a racist. I don't care if they march with Black Lives Matter. I don't care if they're at the border protesting. They are racist because the structures are racist for them and they have the privilege of being complicit with that racism. Now, what I would, uh, what I would um, embrace with open arms are those who are recovering racists, those who recognize how the structures are designed to privilege them and are doing everything possible to dismantle those very structures that are designed to privilege them. And if you say you're colorblind, then you cannot say that you're a racist or that you're a recovering racist. And that's what I think is the, the danger of this colorblind mentality. And as you and I know, the worst thing you could ever tell any person of color is that you're colorblind. So, so just don't do it. <laughs> yeah. I just thank you for unpacking that because I think it's very difficult for people to understand it. So you really said it so clearly uh, by confessing your own sexism. So McGill, thank you for saying that. And I think our readers will really appreciate it. And you know, when it happens to me a lot too, when I address patriarchy and that they think I'm a male hater, you know, like, oh, you know, Grace hates all men. I don't hate all men. I hate the structure, you know, of patriarchy. You know, I'm married to a man. I've got two boys. I don't hate men. I love all men. I love you, Miguel. So it's not. Miguel. So I, I appreciate so much what you just said. I think that's so helpful for us, uh, for those who will be reading your book and then, you know, reading it with maybe listening to the podcast. And uh, tell us the name of the book so people can start ordering it as they're listening to this. What's the name of the book? It's Decolonizing Christianity. Yeah, hold the book because, again, because it's so important. Decolonizing Christianity, Becoming Badass Believers. Yeah, so thank you but for when that. You say that uh -huh. you, when, when you say that um, you don't hate men, mm -hmm. if I can believe that you hate men, then I could dismiss everything you say. Because as long as I think you hate men, mm -hmm. then everything you say can easily be dismissed because you're just you know, uh, a feminazi and you just don't <laughs> like women, you know, you don't like men. And, 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 and I mean, I could just, you're angry. You know, why are you so angry? You should smile more. You'll be, you know, I mean, I could just dismiss everything by laboring you mm -hmm. as hating men or laboring myself as an angry Latino who hates white people. You know, we, we I mean, the culture uses that stereotyping uh -huh. as a form of silencing us. Yeah, thank you for reminding us because yeah, that is a very powerful thing that they do silen silence yeah. us by putting these awful labels on right. us. So yeah, thank you for that. So how many times have you kept quiet or have I kept quiet so as not to have that stereotype thrown at us? Mm -hmm. You know, So we learn how to self-discipline ourselves. And part of this decolonizing process is it's learning not to be our own jailers, not to be our own disciplinarians. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when you say earlier that I'm, I'm very brave for writing this, it's not bravery, it's liberation. I mean, I, I refuse to be my own jailer. I refuse to continue to, to self-discipline myself and not say what needs to be said. It not only liberated you from when you were writing, it liberates all of us as we're reading the book because it's so powerful. Like your words are so intentionally written. For me, when I write, I'm not so intentional, but I felt like every word in that book was so intentionally written. And that's what made it so powerful for me. So I'm sure other readers will find it so powerful. The words just leapt out of the page and it really convicts you. And I was like, I can't wait to talk to McGill about this book because, you know, I've read so many of your books and, you know, when some of the edited books I contributed, but I was really excited from writing, uh, from reading this book. So I'm just so grateful that you wrote it. So as we 
include. Um, I did. Uh -huh. oh, I'm sorry. I did use a different writing style that I usually do when I write when I wrote this one. Um, I really channeled my intellectual mentor Jose Mati, who is a poet. Mm -hmm. He was a revolutionary, an activist, and very poetic. Mm -hmm. So. I, I, there's no way I could ever hold a candle to his brilliancy, mm -hmm. but I really try to channel that 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 that, that poetic um, writing mm -hmm. in putting this book together. So a lot of words, I did spend a lot of time deciding which word to use and which one not to yeah. use well, to, to make it rhyme. I'm not rhyme, but to make it flow. Yeah, I'm glad you told us because we I would have never known, but I noticed so different. <laughs> like the writing style from your previous book. But it, to me, it felt like so in your face kind of writing, but you know, it is different. And I felt every word was so intentionally placed. So thank you for telling us the background and how you wrote so differently. So as we conclude, because I think we could just talk all day about your book, but I know you've got your other books to write. I, I know probably as you're even talking to me, you're thinking about your other projects. Um, what is, if there was one thing that people can take from your book, what do you want people to take? I know there's a million things, but if you had to just take one thing, it is a very powerful book, what would it be? If the reader is a reader of color, mm -hmm. what I would truly hope is that they would reject this white Christianity that has kept them in prison for so long and that they begin to see the divine through their own cultural symbols, which is as worthy and as powerful and as true as Eurocentric symbols. Um, that's what I would hope that the reader of color would take from it. And if a white person would be reading this from that social location and hearing us have this conversation, I would hope that they get saved. Thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Miguel de la Torre for being with us. Thank you so much for writing the previous book on bearing white privilege. And for today's book, Decolonizing Christianity, um, available early and it's published by Erdman's uh, Press. Uh, I just am so grateful for you to, uh, I wanted to say be brave, but you are saying liberated from writing this book. And it has really challenged me. And I know it will challenge all your readers, whether they are white or people of color. And I just look forward to the other, is it four more books that are coming out by the end of this year? Before this year's out, I have uh, two that come out this month, one <laughs> in May and then one in, um, in September. Miguel, like people can't, read even five books a year. <laughs> People can't read five books in 10 years. I don't know how you could write five in one year. That Well, no, I, just... I didn't write five. That would be seven because I already published three, <laughs> including this one. Oh my gosh. I can't keep up with you, Miguel. Um, I just... But you I know, am I, so amazed by you. But, 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 but I, and I appreciate, I appreciate the cop. I really do. But, but going just back to what we were talking about earlier, it doesn't matter that I published seven books this year or 41 before the year's out. I still lack academic rigor in the eyes of my white colleagues. Um, I am still dismissed as not being scholarly because I deal with issues of, um, of, of activism. Um, we, you know, and, and- And that breaks my heart. But uh, but it's the truth. But it's yeah. the truth. I mean, and I, it's I not just what, I me. I know what you're saying. Yeah. You know, we, we have we have a lot of friends of color who yeah. write as much as I do, who who, who I think have reshaped mm -hmm. the discourse, and they just dismiss. And then one of my white colleagues writes one book, and the I get it, Miguel, because I know, and I'm just thankful that you that you just keep marching on. And you keep speaking and you keep um, writing and you just keep on and preaching. So thank you, Miguel. Thank you. I am so grateful that we are friends and I'm so grateful for all your books, your academic rigor, 
and the challenges that you bring to us. I just am forever grateful for you. So please, well, thank you. Yeah. So please go out and order Decolonizing Christianity and also the previous book, Bury, uh, Burying White Privilege. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today uh, on Madang. And thank you, Dr. Miguel de la Toro, for being with us and sharing your words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you for having me.